Welcome to the Veterans Hour, a program produced by the Rachel Corey Chapter 109 Veterans for Peace in Olympia, Washington. I am Mark Fleming, your host for this program. Veterans for Peace is a global organization of military veterans and allies whose collective efforts build a culture of peace. As veterans, we are a unique and important voice uh, to inform the public about the true causes and the enormous costs of war. And we also emphasize the nation's obligations to heal the wounds of war. The Rachel Corey chapter in Olympia is one of over 140 Veterans for Peace chapters worldwide, whose work includes educating the public, dismantling the war economy, assisting veterans and victims of war, eliminating nuclear weapons, and most significantly, working to end all wars. Uh, this program is about the origins and impacts of the Vietnam War. The video, Notes and Images from the Vietnam War, is produced by Jill Godmillow and is aimed at high school students. Uh, in it, Ms. Godmillow uh, states that the Vietnam War is one of the three most difficult topics for social studies uh, teachers to explain to high school students. So in the video, it provides in pictures and wo words a brief history of Vietnam's wars for independence, of which America's war in Vietnam was the final chapter, it also describes the tactics used by the United States against the Vietnamese and shows the impact of the anti-war movement by active duty uh, service members, veterans, and civilians that successfully challenged the underlying rationales for, for the war. The National Network op Opposing the Militarization of Youth describes the video as an important class resource for understanding the Vietnam War. The film is highly critical of the Vietnam War and the miracle, the material can be upsetting. The producer and the Rachel Corey chapter believe that young adults can and must grapple with the grim history and presence of the Vietnam War in order to repeating the same mistakes. And now let's watch notes and images from the Vietnam War. A friend told me that high school teachers of American history say the three hardest things to explain to students are, one, the failure of Reconstruction after the Civil War in the South, and the new Jim Crow laws, a disaster for the civil rights of African Americans. Two, westward expansion, genocidal wars against Native American populations, 10 million massacred, and three, the tragic Vietnam War and I mean tragic. The Vietnam War may be the hardest U.S. war to explain. It went on for roughly 20 long years in a tiny country in Asia, 8,000 miles from the United States. <laughs> 
Vietnam was an impoverished country of rice farmers, 80% Buddhist. More than 3,500,000 Vietnamese died, and in neighboring countries, 600,000 Cambodians and 70,000 Laotians were also killed. And more than 58,000 U.S. soldiers, sailors, and pilots died fighting there. It's not a nice story. Actually, it's not a story at all. A classical story or narrative goes like this. Two men set off across the valley, had many adventures, and returned home safely. Almost no one returned home safely from Vietnam, which is typical of all wars. Vietnam is now revered all over the world because like David in the Bible, they defeated the most powerful Goliath in the world with the largest, most powerful, and deadly military force than any known to mankind. America tells this war very differently, driven by an absolute craving to cover up national shame. U.S. memories of the Vietnam War have been consigned to a strange netherworld, always in the background hardly ever confronted. I have only 45 minutes of your time, so I'll tell you this not a story as fast as I can with just photographs, so we can look long and hard into them and see for ourselves what the photographers saw. Here's a brief and complicated history, the whys and wherefores of the U.S. war in Vietnam, just the bare bones of this story. Please follow along as best you can. Vietnam, far away, fragrant, colorful, seductive. A mysterious land reminiscent of ceiling fans, French baguettes, straw hats, and bicycles laden with goods. A peasant country the size of Arizona. The U.S. involvement in the war in Vietnam, roughly from 1955 to 1975, was fueled by a toxic fear of communism, an imperial ambition for a land base in Asia, and eventually a near-psychotic fear of losing face. Once we started it, we couldn't quit, as more and more resources were invested each year through five U.S. presidents, none of whom were capable of admitting defeat. In the late 19th century, the French colonized, ruled, and exploited Vietnam for 80 years before losing it to the Japanese during World War II. After the war, the French fought to reimpose colonial rule, but this time fiercely opposed by a new guerrilla movement for self-determination, led by the revolutionary Viet Minh in the North. The Viet Minh was a national liberation organization intent on unification of their country and supported by the communist governments of nearby China and the Soviet Union. September 2nd, 1945, the Viet Minh leader, Ho Chi Minh, declared Vietnam's independence from France, quoting from our own Declaration of Independence and asking for help from the U.S., which was never offered. After nine years of fierce battles, the Viet Minh finally beat the French at the Battle of Dien Bien Phu, and the French withdrew from Vietnam. In 1954, the International Geneva Convention, charged with dismantling French Indochina, extracted the former colonies of Cambodia and Laos, and admits contentious struggles between various parties temporarily separated Vietnam into two zones. The Democratic Republic of Vietnam was to rule the North under a communist government, and the South became the newly created Republic of Vietnam, with its capital in Saigon. The Geneva Accords stipulated that elections under international supervision were to be held in two years to reunite the country. It was widely expected that Ho Chi Minh would win the election and that he would become president of a unified Vietnam. The election never happened. By this point, 
the U.S. was unwilling to allow Vietnam to reunify under a communist government, proclaiming that the Vietnamese people weren't ready for independence. The new president of South Vietnam, Diem, a Catholic in a largely Buddhist country installed by and beholding to the U.S., was a notoriously corrupt politician and ruled his one-party authoritarian state brutally. His only virtue in American eyes was that he was not a communist and he did what he was told. He refused to participate in the election and began to clean the territory of communist sympathizers. He supported mainly Catholic landlords and businessmen and tried to dominate the rural Buddhist population. Why did the U.S. sabotage an election to unify a small state on the other side of the world? The U.S. had become the self-appointed champion of international opposition to the spread of communism after World War II and for 44 years led what was called the Cold War against communism. It said that the so-called domino theory dictated U.S. thinking, which proposed that if Vietnam became communist, other countries in the region would fall to communism, one by one, like dominoes. Here are some other useful explanations. As the, quote, leader of the free world, the U.S. wanted to prevent Vietnam from becoming another example of a social revolution for national independence, as Cuba had in 1958. Also, perhaps to gain control of natural resources of the region, rubber, tin, petroleum, rice, and other strategic commodities. Dem's South Vietnamese government had little support among its people, and in the South, the opposition formed a guerrilla group known to its enemies as the Viet Cong. The Viet Cong began to fight back against the brutal repression by the Diem regime and turned the tide against the South Vietnamese forces in 1963. Only after the war was well underway did large units from the North Vietnamese Army arrive on the Southern Front. The U.S.'s puppet, the Republic of South Vietnam, survived for 12 more years, only through an exorbitant investment of American money, guns, planes, and American and Vietnamese lives. The French President de Gaulle had warned Kennedy way back in May 1961, quote, you will find that intervention in this area will be an endless entanglement. Once a nation has been aroused, no foreign power, however strong, can impose its will upon it. The ideology which you invoked will make no difference. Indeed, in the eyes of the masses, it will become identified with your will to power. That is why the more you become involved out there against communism, the more the communists will appear as the champions of national independence and the more support they will receive. Very wise advice, but it fell on deaf ears. That year, Kennedy sent 400 combat troops to South Vietnam as, quote, advisors, unquote. U.S. involvement in the war increased dramatically over the following decade, and at the peak of fighting in 1969, the U.S. was using 550,000 of its own military personnel and thousands more from South Korea, Australia, and other allies. Here's the fundamental strategic flaw for the U.S. They proposed to create a viable, legitimate, democratic South Vietnam. But the more the U.S. intervened, the more the legitimacy of South Vietnam was undermined. Any hope of military victory for the U.S. and South Vietnam faded in 1965. Then the U.S. objective became to, quote, convince the enemy that he could not win, unquote, and would give up the battle. When the enemy remained unconvinced, the next U.S. goal appeared, quote, to avoid a humiliating defeat, which could sour the reputation of the United States and its president. The war went on for years until the U.S. was defeated and started pulling out its troops in 1973. Then Saigon fell to the Democratic Republic of Vietnam and the National Liberation Front, the Viet Cong, and the war was over. In 
now that you've heard the history, I'll try to summarize for you how the U.S. conducted this war against an indigenous peasant army in Vietnam. For Vietnam, it was an unleashing of advanced war technology on a rural peasant society, and for the U.S., a frontless war of endless frustration, death, and destruction. How do you fight a war when it's hard to distinguish Vietnamese friends from the enemy? You end up using tactics that target many civilians. It was a hopeless horror show, a very disheartening one. Please try not to turn away. These were our tactics, our strategies, our programs. There was Agent Orange. From 1961 to 71, under the code name Operation Ranch Hand, the U.S. military dropped more than 19 million gallons of toxic chemicals on South and Central Vietnam, primarily Agent Orange, an herbicide and defoliant which contains dioxin, one of the most toxic chemicals known to mankind. The goal of the program was to deprive Viet Cong fighters of food by destroying crops and also to destroy the jungle so they would have no cover, no place to hide. By 1971, 12% of the total area of South Vietnam had been sprayed with defoliating chemicals. Over 4 million people were directly exposed to Agent Orange, many of them multiple times. U.S. soldiers were also exposed, as Agent Orange was sprayed around the perimeter of U.S. bases to destroy the surrounding foliage so that incoming enemy could be spotted. Once Agent Orange is in the soil, the dioxin has a half-life of more than 100 years. It can get lodged in human DNA and be passed from generation to generation. No one knows when or even if it can ever be cleansed. To this day, it still has the capacity to damage unborn children through the uterus and then through mother's milk, 60 years after spraying began. Today, there are thousands of Vietnamese and American children born with missing fingers extra fingers and toes, missing arms, feet, and eyes. A known carcinogen, it can cause stillbirths, cancers, skin lesions, heart problems, respiratory and other cancers, limb deformities, and reproductive system disorders. It impairs their immune and nervous systems and causes babies born with no brains. Without question, Operation Ranch Hand was the most destructive instance of chemical warfare in modern history. It was recently estimated that over 300,000 U.S. Vietnam vets had died from exposure to Agent Orange. There were cluster bombs. The U.S. dropped them all over South Vietnam. These were large casings filled with hundreds of small bomblets about the size of a baseball designed to explode near ground level over a wide area, releasing metal fragments to maim and kill. Often the bombs failed to detonate. To this day, children find these metal balls on soccer fields and farmlands and toss these, quote, toys to one another in games of catch until they explode and children die. Since the end of the war in 1975, nearly 40,000 Vietnamese have been killed and 67,000 maimed by unexploded landmines, cluster bombs, and other ordnance. Around 800,000 tons remain scattered across the country. An enormous effort is underway to clear them from the landscape, but at the current rate, it will take 300 years. The wars of the past continue to kill today. There was napalm. In a campaign called Operation Rolling Thunder, the U.S. dropped napalm bombs on Vietnamese civilians. Napalm is a mixture of sticky gel and an incendiary petrochemical which envelops everything it touches in inextinguishable fire. Napalm cannot be wiped off skin. Even when burning, napalm will float on water. Within 80 yards of an exploding napalm bomb, survival is impossible. Napalm bombs were primarily dropped in rural areas, largely occupied by women and children. 
By the end of the war, a quarter million children were dead, and another three quarters of a million had been wounded or maimed. Napalm had been developed by Dow Chemical, famous at the time for its kitchen product, Saran Wrap, which was boycotted by anti-war civilians throughout the war. Then there are the programs that are harder to visualize, but no less horrific. There was the CIA's program of torture and assassination, the Phoenix program. Vietnamese people suspected of being the enemy were tortured for information. Then their corpses were simply dumped. No formal prosecution, no record. By 1972, more than 26,000 Vietnamese people were victims of what was called pump and dump. They were free fire zones. These were areas of the countryside as large as 80 square miles, where bombing and shelling could be carried out without permission from higher ranks of the U.S. military, on the assumption that any human being encountered there must be the enemy. Free fire zones were designed to raise the number of, quote, kills, unquote. The goal was to make contact, kill as many people as possible, and move on in search of more. For the U.S. and Vietnam, the bottom line was the number of enemies killed, which was reported each day on the network evening news to encourage citizens to believe that the war could and would be won. There were Zippo raids, named for the popular cigarette lighters of the time, used by American soldiers to set villagers' huts on fire. Villages were then forced into resettlement camps, surrounded by barbed wire or sharpened stakes. By the end of the war, most of the villages in South Vietnam had been damaged or destroyed, and millions of peasants driven from their homes by Zippo raids and napalm bombs. There was rape of Vietnamese women by U.S. soldiers. Rape and the subsequent murder of the women took place on such a large scale that many soldiers considered it standard operating procedure, an unofficial military policy. The macho racist culture fostered in the military contributed to the dehumanization of Vietnamese women and made this violence possible. Rape is a weapon of all wars, but here it was intensified by the prevalence of women in the North Vietnamese forces. The threat of an American soldier being killed by a female guerrilla resulted in greater violence against all Vietnamese women, not to mention racist indifference to the lives of, quote, gooks, slopes, dinks, and slant eyes, unquote. North Vietnamese, a revolutionary government seeking reunification and independence, had no choice but to defend themselves, to do everything in their power to force the U.S. to pack up and go home, which is what, in the end, they did. In April 1967, at Riverside Church in New York City, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. gave a talk called Beyond Vietnam, a time to break silence. Here is how he described the people whose land we were burning and bombing. Quote, they watch as we poison their water, as we kill a million acres of their crops. They must weep as the bulldozers roar through their areas, preparing to destroy their precious trees. They wander into the towns and see thousands of children, homeless, without clothes, running in packs on the street like animals. They see the children degraded by our soldiers as they beg for food. They see the children selling their sisters to our soldiers soliciting for their mothers. We are fighting a war. I'm convinced that it is one of the most unjust wars that has ever been fought in the history of the world. The tactics the United States used in Vietnam, Agent Orange, torture, cluster bombs, free fire zones, Zippo raids, and napalm bombs, were damaging to American soldiers as well, but in ways that we do not often talk about. This favor with the Vietnam War was common in the streets of America, but also common in the jungles, camps, and field hospitals of Vietnam, fueled by a spreading feeling among GIs that the war was meaningless and futile, and that they had been lied to about why they were there. <laughs> 
Of the more than 58,000 U.S. soldiers who died in Vietnam, the average age was 19. Many veterans are still haunted by unspeakable images, memories of buddies being shot or burned and dying. Thus, post-traumatic stress disorder is a normal and predictable reaction. Moral injury, an injury to the individual's moral conscience and values from perpetrating acts of killing, torture, bombing, and more, produces profound emotional guilt and shame, the heart and soul's reaction to unthinkable destruction. It's estimated that close to 200,000 Vietnamese veterans have committed suicide, a number that tells us a lot about the spiritual toll that war took on for survivors. To this day, many thousands of vets live on our streets, not only unrewarded, but even disadvantaged by their service. In 1971, we learned of the Pentagon Papers, a 7,000-page top-secret government study of U.S. decision-making under Eisenhower, Kennedy, and Johnson. It demonstrated unconstitutional behavior by these three presidents, the violation of their oath and the violation of the oath of every one of their subordinates. It was illegally released by Daniel Ellsberg and Anthony Russo to the New York Times, the Washington Post, and other newspapers. The Pentagon Papers illustrated how various administrations had systematically lied about the war to the public, but also to Congress. Likewise, later under Nixon, the U.S. had secretly enlarged the scope of its actions in Vietnam with the bombings of Cambodia and Laos, none of which had been reported in the mainstream media. Most of the Pentagon staff knew that the war couldn't be, quote, won, unquote, but were terrified about the U.S. being labeled as losers. They kept sending troops after the Pentagon Papers had been submitted to them in order, they said, to get the Vietnamese to the peace talks, where they negotiated for four years while 29,000 more American soldiers died. The lies and obfuscations continued. A year after the release of the Pentagon Papers, President Nixon directed the heaviest bombing of North Vietnam of the war. As the Pentagon Papers tell us, those in charge of the war knew we couldn't win, yet they kept fighting for years. Why? There are many rationalizations, but it is this feature of the Vietnam War which most haunts us today. Recent documents indicate a similar phenomenon in Afghanistan. Military and political leaders privately acknowledging that the war is unwinnable, yet making rosy public assessments and supporting further escalation. If there are lessons from the Vietnam War, it seems clear those in charge refuse to learn them. Who finally stopped this unwinnable war? Who finally convinced the president, Congress, and citizens that it wasn't worth spending more money, suffering more humiliation, and losing more American lives on a futile and immoral war. First, there was the increasingly fierce resistance from active duty GIs and vets, both in Vietnam and at home. Second, the tireless civilian anti-war movement, started primarily by church groups and college and high school students, which lasted for nine years. And most important, there were the tireless fighters of the NLF, who eventually overpowered the U.S. military forces and ended the war, finally. In August of 1965, 61% of the U.S. population approved of American involvement in Vietnam. Just six years later, by May of 1971, it was exactly reversed. Now 61% thought our involvement was wrong. Perhaps the most dramatic evidence of the change was the GIs coming back from Vietnam who organized to end the war. Many came home with a mission, 
to tell the truth about wartime atrocities being committed and to demand an immediate end to the killing. Active duty soldiers and their civilian supporters established GI coffee houses outside dozens of military bases throughout the U.S. There, soldiers and veterans could find each other and realize they were not alone. Together, they planned protests, marches, and demonstrations on base and off. More than 300 anti-war newspapers were published, packed with first-hand accounts from the front lines and damning information that the military brass tried to suppress. Even in high schools in the late 60s, there were close to 500 underground newspapers. They were the social media of their time. The military hit back against the coffee houses and their underground newspapers. This often involved discharge, demotion, and transfer for the soldiers, and an increase in harassment by undercover FBI agents, local police, not to mention the hostility of the pro-military towns where many coffee houses were located. Some were bombed, others were burned to the ground by vigilantes. Beginning in 1967, returning GIs formed the national group VVAW, Vietnam Veterans Against the War, who led many of the anti-war marches and demonstrations. They organized the Winter Soldier Hearings in Detroit in 1971 to expose war crimes and atrocities they had witnessed or participated in. I've, I've never seen him thrown out of my airplane because it's behind me, but uh, we had a couple of guys, used to blindfold the guys with safety wire mm -hmm. and pull them real tight, and uh, used to have contests seeing how far they could throw the bound bodies out of the airplane and you know, throw one as far as he can and see if he can get the other one farther. I think every person that was in Vietnam was in the infantry used CS, which is a gas, chemicals, woolly peter, that's white phosphorus. If we thought it might be VC infested or something like this, we'd uh, send in woolly peter mortars and uh, this would start the uh, hooches burning and also kill people. It's probably one of the worst sights I've ever seen is a person that's been burned by Willie Peter because it doesn't stop. It just burns all completely through your body. The only way you can uh, end this uh, burning is to cut off the air. It's very difficult. In April of 1971, VVAW held its first national demonstration. More than 2,000 vets camped on the mall near the Capitol, lobbied Congress, and defied a Supreme Court order to disperse. One by one, they threw away more than 700 military medals and combat ribbons on the Capitol steps and made brief statements, sometimes emotionally, sometimes in icy, bitter calm. By the end of the war, it's estimated that more than one quarter of active duty soldiers had participated in the anti-war movement, a coalition of white, black, and Latino soldiers who helped to stop the Vietnam War. The GI and veteran movements are among the most important and the least talked about aspects of protest during the war. Though many veterans supported and still support the war, the amount of GI opposition was unprecedented in U.S. history. This war was also stopped by the largest civilian peace movement in American history, by young men who illegally burned their required draft cards by those who escaped the draft to Canada and Sweden and did anti-war work there, by prayer vigils, by the women's strike for peace, by concerned clergy such as the Catholic priests Daniel and Philip Berrigan and their supporters who seized files from draft boards and set them on fire with homemade napalm, among many others. The movement was sustained by millions of college and high school students and civilians who held endless teach-ins rallies, student walkouts and strikes, and huge mobilizations to stop the war. Additional involvement came from other groups, including educators, clergy, poets, performers, journalists, lawyers, and physicians. Popular depictions of the civilian anti-war movement suggest that protesters were mostly privileged white kids, but we should remember a different, much more diverse movement with broad participation across class, race, and generation. Groups such as the Black-Led Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, SNCC, and the Chicano Moratorium explicitly framed their opposition to the war in class-based experiences of the draft and recruited within working-class communities 
connecting their demands to end the war with problems of unemployment, affordable housing, policing, quality schools, and health care. It began with demonstrations in 1964 against the escalating role of the United States in Vietnam. It became a broad social movement over the next several years and helped shape the vigorous and polarizing debate on how to end the war. The actions were mainly peaceful, nonviolent events. In many cases, police used violent tactics against the demonstrators. As the presidents escalated the war, more troops, more bombing, more falsehoods about American intentions, the peace movement organized larger and more confrontational demonstrations. The first to oppose the war early on were members of traditional peace churches, like the Quakers, Amish, and Mennonites. They organized local vigils and offered free draft counseling. Rather than serve in the military, tens of thousands burned their draft cards or returned them to the selective service. Thousands of COs, conscientious objectors, did two years of alternative service or worked in the military in non-combat roles. Over 500,000 young men rejected the draft system and refused to be inducted into the military. 5,000 draft resistors went to prison. Imagine, at age 18, some were just 16 or 17, being forced to fly across the world to fight in a war in which you had no stake. Also consider what a radical transition relatively square kids in small towns across the U.S. must have made to devote themselves to anti-war work and maybe jail time. And ask yourself, in today's all-volunteer army, whether many of those who join feel like they have no other good options for getting an education, health care, and having a decent life. Doing anti-war work meant giving speeches at teach-ins and rallies, writing pamphlets, articles and books, painting picket signs, circulating petitions and leaflets, demonstrating at army bases, lobbying Congress, testifying before war crimes hearings, researching corporate and university complicity, harboring deserters, organizing strikes, heckling generals and politicians, and going to prison for defying the draft. It's hard to convey the emotions that inspired these actions. Probably the most widely shared across the country was simply outrage. Some notable dates include on January 15, 1968, 5,000 women rallied in D.C., the first all-female anti-war protest. On March 17, 1968, in London, 400,000 protesters tried to storm the U.S. Embassy, and there were also big anti-war rallies in Sweden, France, the Netherlands, Spain, Germany, China, Cuba, and Australia. On November 15, 1969, during the moratorium march on Washington, there were four million supporting protests around the country, later a hundred demonstrations a day. In April 1970, Nixon announced the U.S. incursions into Cambodia to destroy the jungle headquarters of the Viet Cong. There were 885 campus protests. Four to five million students participated, the largest in history. Four protesting students were killed at Kent State University by National Guard soldiers and two at Jackson State by local police. Nine others were wounded. In response, 536 colleges were shut down completely by protest, 51 for the entire year, on and on, year after year, until the war was over. Three decades later, Robert McNamara, who served as defense secretary for both presidents Kennedy and Johnson, renounced his wartime claims. McNamara conceded that the United States had been, quote, terribly wrong to intervene in Vietnam. He wrote, If only he had known that Hanoi was not the pawn of Beijing or Moscow. <laughs> 
If only he had realized that the domino theory was wrong, he might have persuaded his bosses to withdraw from Vietnam. Why didn't experts like McNamara know what was obvious to so many others? Millions of lives could have been saved. It's hard to fathom and harder, maybe impossible, to believe or forgive him. Ward Just, from the foreword to his 1968 book, To What End, wrote, of course the war was unwinnable. It was useless to fight the Vietnamese. They would have fought for a thousand years. In fact, the Vietnamese had been fighting against the Chinese, Mongol invaders, the French, the Japanese, again the French, and the U.S. since the 15th century. A thousand years is nothing to the Vietnamese. Finally, here's an amazing footnote about the anti-war movement, the Tinker story, a very hopeful story. Early in the war, in December 1965, in Des Moines, Iowa, a student, John Tinker, age 15, his sister Mary Beth, age 13, along with a friend, 16-year-old Chris Eckert, held a meeting one evening and after much discussion, made a decision to wear black armbands to school to publicize their objections to the Vietnam War and to support an extension of the 12-hour Christmas truce that had been called for by the North Vietnamese and Senator Robert F. Kennedy. The three students wore simple black armbands to school on a Monday morning. Each was confronted by the administration of their school who asked the students to remove them. All three refused, and each was immediately suspended from school. Through their parents, the students sued the school district for violating their right of expression, as protected in the First Amendment of the U.S. Constitution. But the local court dismissed the case and held that the school's actions were reasonable in order to uphold school discipline. Then the U.S. Court of Appeals affirmed that decision. The families were approached by the American Civil Liberties Union, which helped the students bring a freedom of speech suit against the school board to the U.S. Supreme Court. Here's just a little of the testimony by the justices and the Tinker lawyers. Just listen for a while. Uh, what if the student had gotten up in the class he went to and uh, delivered the message orally that uh, his armband uh, was intended to convey and insisted on doing it? I think in that case... All your, during the hour. Yes, in that case, Your Honor, we would not be here, even if he insisted on doing it only for a second, because he would clearly be... Uh, although he would be expressing his views, he would be doing something else. Why did they wear the armband to the class? To express that message? To express the message, yes, To everybody in the class? To everyone in the class, yes, And everybody, while they were listening to some other subject matter, was supposed to also be uh, looking at the armband and taking in that message? Well, to the extent that they would see it, but I don't believe there was any... I don't believe that the... Well, it wasn't they were intended to see it, weren't they? The policy was adopted, uh, frankly, for the purpose uh, and the... Uh, the administrators and the teachers say this over and over again. It was the principle of the demonstration, the idea of expressing political beliefs that they were opposed to in this context. The Vietnam War and the involvement of the United States therein has been a subject of a major controversy for some time. When the armed band regulation involved herein was promulgated, a <clears throat> protest march against the war had recently been held in Washington, D.C., a wave of draft card-burning incidents protesting the war had swept the country. A former student of one of our high schools was killed in Vietnam. Some of his friends are still in school. It was felt that if any kind of a demonstration existed, it might evolve into something which would be difficult. So with me is uh, Larry Kirshner, also a member of the uh, Rachel Corey chapter, and also a Vietnam veteran. So the two of us both served in Vietnam and have some uh, definite perspective. And Larry, what, what did you see in that video that uh, struck home? Um, you know, to, to start with, it's one of the most effective uh, anti-war pieces that I've, that I've seen. Um, it, it made me consider the, uh, the, ex the expensive and, um, long Vietnam, um, series that Ken Burns did. Um, this spent, I'm sure, significantly less money, uh, 
and is more compressed, but I found it to be much more effective uh, to share what I see as the important um, knowledge to, to know about this war. I always say that my uh, political education began in the jungles of Vietnam, and this, uh, this video just reinforces you know, all of that for me. Yeah, and I think the big difference between Ken Burns and this is this is much more direct. I mean, you see the photographs. It's not a lot of a lot of ongoing video. It's just pictures more and more. And I thought it really showed the humanity of the Vietnamese, uh, both the people who were affected by the war, as well as the National Liberation Front and the NVA, how determined they were and the diversity. You saw the women. You saw the young people. You saw the people on the Ho Chi Minh Trail. Uh, it was very direct and it gave a sense of why uh, they were able to prevail against the greatest military power uh, on earth at the time. Yeah, it, when she said um, that Vietnam was the size of Arizona and that kind of struck, I hadn't noticed that the first time I, I watched this, but um, this is a tiny country and yet was able to defeat the uh, imperialist uh, forces of the United States that had all of the goodies, had all of the money, but those of us who went there as foreign invaders, we were up against people who were fighting for their homes. Exactly. And that was the difference. I always tell, tell people that my great realization in Vietnam was that we were fighting this war in somebody's backyard. In the, yeah, in the Vietnamese yeah. backyard and thought about what would it be like to have troops in my backyard here in America. Um, yeah. and that was a profound awareness. And we saw how well or how strongly they defended that. Yeah, yeah. Well, in, you know, I think about what's going on in Ukraine and um, thinking about the, the, the people in the streets opposing the war in Vietnam, making their their voices heard. And you don't hear, you hear very little of that about what's going on in Ukraine. Um, there's, there's a lot of rah-rah, let's, let's support these people who are being invaded. And there's that whole part of it. Um, and we're spending billions literally uh, over there. But you don't hear much about, um, diplomacy or seeking nonviolent ways to, to uh, deal with this situation. And that was, that was the whole focus of, of what went on um, during the Vietnam War, or I should say the American War in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. Is the, and of course, when it, when it began, there was really no talk of diplomacy. It was just kind of, and that once it got started, trying to start get diplomacy underway was very difficult. You yeah, know, I recall how the, it, how long it took them to even agree on the side, the, the, the shape of the table for the peace yeah. talk. Yeah, yeah. And those uh, talks went on for four years. Yeah, yeah, and that made uh, gave Henry Kissinger a Nobel Peace Prize. One of the grand <laughs> ironies of history. Yeah. And actually, one of the things I thought was interesting on this is, you know, they, they give a short history of the war. They also talk about the tactics, you know, everything from uh, the search and destroy, using agent arms, cluster bombs, napalm. They mentioned the Phoenix program, the free fire zones. And the one term I had not heard, but I certainly recall it, is uh, Zippo. Uh, oh, yeah. The Zippo raids, where they would tor right. use Zippo right. lighters to torch uh, somebody's um, pooches. Yeah. Uh, and I have to seeing admit, that, I, re I remember our outfit doing that, uh, lighting uh, the hooches that had people's uh, year supply of rice in it. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, this, I, you know, I'm ashamed. Yeah. So. Well, the same, you know, I don't recall doing any of that. Uh, you know, we destroyed a lot of flour and supplies hidden under rocks in the woods. Yeah. Uh, but my unit, you know, when I was there, we didn't, I didn't experience that, but I know what went on. And like you said, I was a foreign occupier. Exactly. And I think yeah. that's one of the things that when you're when thinking about Ukraine, the Russians are having a difficult time and because they're seen as a foreign occupier. Exactly. Uh, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, 
yeah, that it's it's in some ways it's not as clear cut, at least in my mind, as Vietnam was. But um, it it you know it it took me going there, becoming radicalized by the reality, and then coming home where it was safe to think about it. Mm -hmm. um, so I, there, I'm sure there's a lot of uh, uh, second guessing going on in Ukraine and in Russia too. Um, but they bo both sides need to realize nobody's going to win. Right. So, and then where's there's a, where there's a dispute, then you need to think of other ways other than uh, violence. And yeah. you know, right, we tend to see the Russians in America, we see the Russians as the aggressor. Right. Uh, but at the same time, we also know that Russia, had, you know, they've, they've complained about NATO for years and we haven't addressed those. Right. It doesn't mean it doesn't give them the right to invade, but it certainly means there's a dynamic there that hasn't been addressed. And exactly that's, where you, right. that's where you get war. Exactly right. And, and, and unfortunately, this proxy war that we have with Russia both sides have nuclear weapons and one little tiny mistake could be the end of everything. That's right. And you don't hear the the media in this country talking much about those possibilities. No. Uh, if if you if you look at a lot, you know, there are a lot of sites that do do address that, but they're not part of the mainstream. I mean, right. ma yeah. Mainstream says nuclear weapons are there and they're dangerous, but that's about it. But you look at some of the other sites that um, they talk about. Well, what are the scenarios? How can they develop? You know, what are the what are the safeguards? What are the risks? Right. You know, in Vietnam, you know, there were no nuclear weapons. In fact, they didn't even have very good air defense. Uh, so right. we we reigned supreme. Uh, and again, we had total advantage. So we could do it. And we could pretty much bomb and strafe at will, and we did. Uh, whereas in this war, we can't do those things. So there's a, wow. there is that that difference, yeah. And, I think, yeah. and one of the, and I think what one of the things the Russians have learned or should have learned is that you, know, you can threaten war, you can claim to do you know we have the power, it's going to be a three day war, but once they launch that you know all the bets are off, and the same thing happened to us in America. I mean, no, you know, Lyndon Johnson said I can't you know he. He used a term that I can't use on air, uh, yeah. referring to Vietnam as a certain small country. Uh, he said, you know, that there's no reason why they, they should even resist us at all. And yet they did. Yeah. And I think I, you see that in, in this video, that, you know, the resistance was, it was strong, it was determined, it was fierce. Right. Yeah. The, the humanity that comes through in this video is pretty amazing. Yeah. yeah. Because the, the Vietnamese people were real people. Mm -hmm. so, um, yeah, I, I just highly recommend this video. I, I'd, like, I'd like every kid or every young person in this country to see, see yeah. this. It's, uh, it's a, a more, a, a real, a re realistic look at war as opposed to, you know, with John Wayne or- Exactly. And it's also a good example of, you know, the United States went into it thinking this would no, be no big deal. And yet it turned into this long running catastrophe. Yeah, and that's, I what think, happened, I think, and that's why diplomacy makes a big can, It does. Big and difference. I think that's what's happening in Ukraine. Russia expected it to be, uh, you know, we'll go in and uh, what was it? Uh, they said when we went into Iraq, it was going to be like three days and they were going to meet us with flowers and candy. Right. And I read the other day that 25,000 Russian troops have died already in this, which okay. they expected to be just a very simple, um, you know, show of power in their neighborhood. People so, defending their homeland can be extremely yeah. uh, resistant. Yeah. Yeah. So we're running out of time. You also want to point out, you have a poem that pretty much sums up the whole point of war. So I'd like you to read that before we uh, go to close. Sure. Um, this poem came out of uh, a group of us decided to do some um, anti-recruitment stuff. And, and I interviewed 10 people uh, um, what, you, what you think someone should know if they're considering joining the military based on that person's experience. And I interviewed myself. And uh, 
then uh, developed this poem out of it. It's called The First Man I Killed. The first man I killed was small and hidden in the tall grass. Being a killer forever changes you. Even if you learn to be kind and considerate and civilized, that part of you is always hiding down inside awaiting a chance. A normal person does not want to kill and will avoid it at all costs. The military will not allow you to remain normal. Doesn't matter if you think you're smart enough not to get caught up in their lives, they will change you. Don't be sucked into the biggest myth and lie that killing and dying for your country is somehow heroic. Really be all that you can be. And that, that kind of, like I say, that's where my political education began. Right. Well, thank you very much. That does really sum it up nicely. And I think that really kind of zeroes in on the whole point of the war or the video that we just watched. Um, this really does change people. Yes, it does. So let me, in closing, I just want to point out that the uh, you know, the war in Vietnam ended five decades ago, but its legacy is a cautionary tale for American policymakers contemplating military actions. American and Vietnamese pay dearly only to learn that the very only to learn that military power has very real limits. You know, even military brought to bear on a supposedly much weaker adversary. Despite the high cost, the Vietnam War's lessons were largely ignored uh, during the post uh, U.S. post 9/11 wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, with similar results for Americans, Iraqis, and Af Afghans. And we hope the information presented in notes and images from the Vietnam War will encourage future generations of Americans to remain skeptical of their elder siren calls for war. I want to thank uh, Jill Godmelo and her crew for producing notes and images from the Vietnam War. And thanks for Larry Kirshner uh, for his, uh, participating in the video and for Dennis Mills for recording and producing uh, this video, uh, this program. And also thank Thurston Community Media for broadcasting the Veterans Hour in Thurston County. And thank you for watching. And fade to black. Fade to black. Hey Dennis, are you the one that puts the names on the on the video? When yes. Because you misspell my name every time. Oh my. <laughs> I'm sorry, Shirley. <laughs> <laughs> it's K-E-R-S-C-H-N-E-R. -E -E you commonly leave out the S. Yeah, I do. <laughs>